for inviting me to talk today. I thought I might just um, give a brief overview of ALS or motor neuron disease. I'll be calling it ALS because there's a trend to, I know in Australia we usually talk about motor neuron disease, but uh, internationally now sort of ALS has taken over, probably because the Americans call it ALS, but it's the same thing. So I'll just, when, I, when you hear ALS, it's, it's motor neuron disease. Um, a brief uh, summary of ALS, many of you know a lot about it, having had the disease or knowing someone who has the disease. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the genetics, a very small amount you're pleased to hear, because it's really complex. I'm mostly interested at the moment on the environment, various things that uh, may happen in the environment that could predispose you to getting the disease. So uh, we'll talk a bit about that. So this is, um, <coughs> this is the motor system, and basically you only need two neurons to, to get your muscles to work. You need one up in the brain over here, and that it sends a process down to one in the spinal cord, and the one in the spinal cord tells the muscle what to do. So when you think, I want to move, this neuron, the so-called the upper motor neuron, sends a signal down to the lower motor neuron down over here, the low motor neuron tells the muscle, get going. And uh, in ALS, classically, both of these neurons degenerate for reasons, in most cases, that are completely unclear. Uh, sometimes it's just the one up here, and that's when you get uh, stiffness, especially, spasticity, and your reflexes are very brisk. Sometimes it's just the one down here, and that's when your muscle uh, becomes uh, weak, and get smaller, atrophic, <clears throat> and uh, start twitching, fasciculations. But usually most people have both of those, so they have stiffness as well as uh, weak muscles. <clears throat> but some people have just one, some people just the other. And this is what it looks like in the spinal cord. I'm a neuropathologist, so I actually examine the tissues of people who've had motor neuron disease. Here's the spinal cord, and each of those little dots over there is a motor neuron in the spinal cord, the cell body, and there are about 40 of them. And this is someone who has died of motor neuron disease, and in fact, there's just one motor neuron left. I've blown it up over here. So it's amazing, in fact, how people can survive with so few motor neurons. The ones that are still there do their best to take over the muscle, they actually send out new processes. And so, um, until eventually they, they, they can't manage anymore, and, and then the muscle becomes weak. And this is what it looks like at high power. So here are some normal motor neurons, the cell bodies, very healthy looking. This is a motor neuron that's disappeared it's just gone, and those are the cells that are just mopping up the debris, basically. And this is a process in pathology known as apoptosis. It's single cell death. So it isn't as if there's a lot of inflammation, or there's almost no clues looking at the spinal cord of someone who's had MND as to why that cell should have died. And so this is the, the classic cartoon that's used. Uh, apoptosis. Something tells that cell to die. We don't know what it is. And so it's a why me? Why this particular cell dies off is unknown. It seems a fairly simple question, but in fact I've spent the last 30 years trying to find out just the answer to that single question. Why is that cell dying? Who gets motor neuron disease? Well, anybody can get motor neuron disease. You can be a famous actor, you can be a leader of your people, you can be a football player, you can be an artist. Uh, in all countries, the incidence is pretty similar in prevalence. It used to be thought to be an uncommon disease, or even rare, but we now know that it's not all that uncommon. And it's thought that uh, for a man, you've got about a one in 300 chance of getting ALS or motor neuron disease throughout your life. For a woman, a little less, about one in 450 which isn't all that uncommon. Uh, so a lifetime chance of getting motor neuron disease. 
Uh, we don't see many people with motor neurons. It's not like multiple sclerosis. There seem to be a lot of people around with MS. Of course, as you know, the disease often uh, progresses quite rapidly, not like MS. You can go on for many years you being disabled, but you're still around. That's why it was thought to be a rare disease, but in fact, quite a lot of people get MS, uh, get ALS, which makes it difficult when you have, you hear uh, stories of, uh, you know, someone in a small country town, and there are only uh, 400 people living there, and three of them get motor neuron disease. And people think, oh, there must be something in that town. But in fact, if you look at the data carefully, when you realize that motor neuron disease isn't all that uncommon, uh, it makes you think twice. In the US, you've probably heard it's called Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig played for the New York Yankees. And uh, he famously died of motor neuron disease. And this is a terribly complex slide, a fairly recent, um, the changing scene of ALS over here. And these are all the things that happen in the motor neuron that seem to go wrong. And there are multiple things going wrong. It's not just one thing, unfortunately, that goes wrong. So all these different areas, not just in the cell body, but in the process itself. So there are many, many things. So it's extraordinarily complex, which has led people to think that there isn't a single cause of MND, or motor neuron disease, or ALS, that it might be multiple different causes. And this is the overlying sort of idea most people have of ALS, that there are three things that have to go on. Firstly, you need some genetic susceptibility to the disease, okay? So the second thing is you need something in the environment to trigger it. And the third thing is it seems to only occur on aging. As we know, your genes, the genetic susceptibility has been there all your life. So why do you only get MND when you get to your 50s or 60s or 70s? The genes problem is most likely that there's something over here, some virus or toxin that's triggering it. And the saying people say is your genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. So you're susceptible, you may never get it unless you're exposed to something else during life. It's rather a, a cruel representation of the word Goya, the artist thought of aging over here. So, so the average median age of MND is about 66, 65, 66. You can get it much earlier, of course, and much later. And some people, even if there's a known gene, one person in the family, and I've had this, I used to run the motor neuron disease clinic at Prince Alfred for a number of years, and you would see people come in I remember someone's daughter came in and she had motor neuron disease at 35 and she came in with her parents. Her parents were fine at that stage. And then the father, a few years later, when he was 75, got motor neuron disease. So age does play a, does play a part. And this is uh, another, this is a chap called Amal Chalabi, a very well-known motor neuron disease researcher in the UK in London. And he said that you have this, what they call a genetic load. So that doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. You're just a bit predisposed to it. And then with time, uh, you know, your cell defenses as you get older uh, decrease a little bit. You get a bit unfit maybe. And then environmental exposures. And then once the disease starts, something seems to happen that it accelerates. So once the disease starts, it accelerates. And many people are trying to work out why it spreads once it started. And that's where a lot of the treatments are aimed at, trying to stop the spread. Uh, I'm particularly interested in trying to find this, these early causes to try to stop it starting in the first place. But we're not quite up to that yet. And by rather complex statistical methods, uh, this team thought that there were six different things that had to happen before you got ALS motor neuron disease. So maybe one or two genes or three genes might have to be a bit susceptible and then one or two or three environmental influences. And these could all be different in different people. So you can see it makes it quite difficult to find them all in one particular person. 
So some of our work, so we started, we set up a, um, a motor neuron disease DNA bank uh, some years ago, and some of you may well have given DNA uh, to that bank, and we had a questionnaire about uh, environment as well, trying to work out the uh, genes and the environment, and those, if you did give uh, a blood sample to that bank, it's still being used now in international studies. So we're still using that, that DNA and the environmental data. That was a paper-based questionnaire. You had to write things down. Australia-wide base, so we got some very interesting findings from that. And this was from one paper from that, uh, showing that uh, we looked at uh, different uh, toxins that people might have been exposed to, heavy metals, solvents, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, and then looked at the genes that handle those. And we did find that some people had a susceptibility to those toxins. And then the next thing we did was uh, we looked at trios. So a number of people, we got the DNA from their parents, unaffected parents, and the child, the offspring had motor neuron disease. So that was very nice. So the two parents here were normal, but the child obviously, when the child got older, got motor neuron disease. And so we wanted to look at the uh, difference in the genes. In other words, was this person getting a new gene problem that wasn't apparent in either parent, a new mutation, so maybe they'd been irradiated or exposed to the sun or something, who knows, and got a new mutation. Or could this be uh, bad luck, you know, you might have heard of autosomal recessive inheritance where, you know, you have uh, two alleles or two forms of the gene, one from your mother, one from your father, if the one from your, uh, some of the genes, the one from your mother can be abnormal, she will be okay because the other gene just takes over. The one from the father might be abnormal, his other gene's okay. But if the child happens to get the two bad ones, that's bad luck and they get the disease. And we did find that, um, we did a whole exome, so-called sequencing, that both happened. That in some people that were just unlucky, uh, they happened to get the, the, the bad side of the gene from, from both parents. And in some people, they developed new mutations as they went on. It doesn't explain all of the cases, but uh, it was certainly suggested that genetics can play a part, even if there's no family history of genetics. So you might think you're safe, but it's not this and other work has shown that it's not quite the case, that there does seem to be a risk of getting ALS even if both of your parents uh, didn't have it, which we didn't think was 10 or 15 years ago. People thought it's all sporadic, you know, if, if your parents didn't have it. We then did twin studies. These aren't my twins, but uh, these are identical twins, so they should have all the same genes. Genes should be exactly the same, they're identical. And we looked at um, if ALS was completely genetic, if one twin got ALS, you can be sure the other one would because they've got the same gene. But in fact, that doesn't happen. Only in about 20% of cases of identical twins, if one twin gets it, the other twin doesn't, which really suggests there's a big environmental component. The one twin has been exposed to something else. And we, uh, we looked at this, so we had five pairs of twins, uh, one of whom had motor neuron disease, the other one didn't, as adults, and we looked at all their genes, whole genome, and they were all exactly the same. There was no difference between the two, again suggesting there's something in the environment. Then you might have heard of a thing called gene silencing. Not all your genes are active in all your cells. Obviously, you don't want a brain gene to be producing brain proteins in the liver or vice versa. So most of your genes are actually switched off. They're not working in all the cells. And per perhaps there's some of the, uh, that switching off mechanism, it's called methylation. You might have heard about it. If that, if that gene silencing was wrong, so say you had a gene in your motor neurons that was being switched on inappropriately or off inappropriately. And uh, we can look for that. And we did find, in fact, that there were a number of these so-called epigenetic variations between identical twins. The same identical twins, we then looked at epigenetics. And again, that's very suggestive of an environmental things. If you smoke, for example, cigarettes, 
your gene silencing mechanisms are changed. You, we could pick who the smokers were just by uh, doing this. So again, a clue that there's something more than genetics. You hear a lot about genetics <laughs> because all the smart people have gone into genetics, really. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful field to get into. It's very exciting. You know you're going to find something in the end, although every year you think you've got somewhere and there's another layer of complexity in the genes. It's amazing. But it uh, keeps going. But uh, actually not many people are involved in the environment because the environment is endless. It, it could be anything. It's very hard to, to study. But that does leave the field over for people who are not so smart to get involved and uh, in the environment. These are some of the things that have been thought to be involved in the environment in motor neuron disease. So things like mercury, heavy metals, uh, lead, and batteries, a virus. This is a little girl who has polio. You see she had it and her, she's got a wasted leg over here. Polio gets particularly into motor neurons. And there are other viruses that do as well. So we and other people have been into Could there be some virus that's getting into your motor neurons? Uh, if you've ever been an athlete, uh, you've got an increased risk of having, getting motor neuron disease. Uh, we and others are looking at it as well. The idea that athleticism early in life predisposes you to, to motor neuron disease. I'm quite safe there. And uh, if things you're eating, your diet, Cycad seeds, for example, in certain countries have been suggested to have a toxin. Could there be some toxin that we're eating we don't know about? If you've ever had an electric shock, that's a bad electric shock, enough to sort of throw you across the room, you can get motor neuron disease that starts in the same area that you got the shock, if you were shocked there. And the French workers have looked at this quite a lot. There's something that really shocks the nervous system up. If you've uh, been a footballer over here, you uh, playing soccer, you're more likely, the Italians have shown this, to get motor neuron disease. And you can see this uh, Italian footballer here is in the early stages of motor neuron disease because he's falling for no obvious reason <laughs> over here with this Australian footballer over here in the World Cup. <laughs> so uh, smoking has been suggested by some to be a risk factor, although our Australian study didn't show that. We had a very careful study, it didn't show. So that's why you need these big data sets now for statistics. So smoking still, I'm not sure about that one. And then exposure to toxins. For some reason, airline pilots are more at risk. Again, not many airline pilots. But, uh, and then if you've ever fought in a war, any war at all, it was first known in the Gulf War, but now even the Second World War, you're more likely to get motor neuron, why should that be so? And if you're exposed to herbicides and pesticides, if you work on the land, for example, if you're a farm, you're more likely to get it. And so people then look at these things to say, maybe there's an environmental toxin uh, over here. Maybe they're exposed to something. One thing we're interested in, a uh, bit of excitation, bit of excitement is good. Too much excitement, not too good for, for motor neurons. And I remember I said there were two neurons, one up here and one down here. And this one actually excites the other one with a transmitter called glutamate, which it needs, but too much glutamate actually poisons the, that neuron. So many people think that that's actually what's causing the cell death eventually, too much excitation. And so the cell that calms down this transmission is called an interneuron. It's just between the two neurons and says, that's enough now, you know, take it easy. And we looked for heavy metals like mercury in these interneurons. So these are, the motor neurons are big over here. You can see in this person, they, the black staining is mercury, in fact, which is my favorite heavy metal. Okay, there's the interneuron, a small interneuron over here. That also contains mercury. And you can see it over here. They're tiny little guys. Very understudy, these interneurons. And they're full of mercury in this man. And so when mercury, it poisons cells. And so this is one possibility that these little cells, these interneurons, are being poisoned. And so they can't dampen down this response. So that's too much excitation. 
This was a man uh, who actually injected himself with mercury. It's unusual to be able to study mercury in humans because not many people. He had a psychiatric problem and he injected, he got some thermometers and got the mercury out of it and injected it into his veins. It was all over. He came to Prince Alfred and we could see the mercury in his lungs on x-ray. And then he committed suicide a few weeks later. Poor guy, young bloke. And uh, people knew I was interested in this area, so they uh, let me have a look at his tissues. And the cell in the brain that took up mercury preferentially, this big cell, so the black staining is mercury, that's its upper motor neuron. That's the, tip, that's the motor neuron that's involved in motor neuron disease. And that's the cell that took up mercury. It's being fed mercury by a little supporting cell over here. That's the astrocyte. And the little dots of the mercury entering this. One. So both the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron, the cells that are involved in ALS preferentially take up heavy metals. Where do we get these from, these heavy metals? Uh, well, mercury in particular is from, naturally from volcanoes and things. Uh, burning coal, there isn't a lot of mercury in coal, but because we're burning so much, in fact, mercury in the atmosphere is going up by 3% every year. And some people think that's um, why things like motor neuron disease seem to be going up in incidence. Because mercury in the atmosphere then gets into the ocean, gets into fish, you eat the fish, and you get your mercury that way. So uh, we looked at uh, this possibility that uh, motor neuron disease may be more common in a people who are exposed to herbicides and pesticides. We did find about six times more people uh, got ALS when that was the case in Australia. Uh, one thing we wondered about is occupation. Does your occupation, whatever you're doing, because uh, you know, many of us spend most of our lives on occupation, that's what you're doing all the time. What are we exposed to in the occupation? And so we did an occupational study and uh, we said, is diesel exhaust the link? Because this is what we found. So this is men. It's easier actually to do uh, occupational studies in men because they have more varied occupations. They're more likely to be in occupation than women. I mean, that's not going to be the case in a few years' time, but in this cohort it was. So here are the men. <clears throat> and the occupations, one to eight, there you can grade occupations depending on the levels of, of skills you need. So the one over here, these are people who are managers and professionals, etc. And over here are the, uh, the workmen, the laborers, etc. So the more you're over, over here to the right, the more likely you are to be uh, exposed to things like you know, brick dust or whatever it is. And you'll notice this is when they below the line, the managers over here and the professionals are less likely to get motor neuron disease. As you go along, as you get more towards the machinery operators, drivers, laborers, they are more likely to get motor neuron disease. And so we looked at each individual occupation. So maybe when you're out there in the field, you're exposed to lots of things, you're getting exposed to more toxins. And uh, we looked at individual occupations. And the occupation that was most uh, likely to get motor neuron disease were truck drivers. Truck drivers are known to be exposed to diesel fuel, because most trucks are diesel. And then we looked at all the other occupations that have been suggested to be involved in motor neuron disease, and many of them also had diesel fuel. For example, in the armed forces, most of the tanks and aircraft, etc., are diesel. So we wondered if, uh, if diesel was a, uh, a problem, and we suggested that uh, that may be. I'm particularly interested because I live in Balmain, and as you know, the, uh, the cruise ships now uh, uh, dock in uh, Balmain, in White Bay. And they keep, they don't, because the state government doesn't want to pay for electricity to the ships from the port, they just keep their engines running the whole time they're there. So whenever you go through Balmain, the, the smoke from the, uh, the cruise ships goes past. Unfortunately, cruise ship fuel is usually pretty cheap, nasty stuff, full of diesel and toxins. So it'll be an interesting study to look in 20 or 30 years' time to see if people in Balmain are getting more motor neuron disease. 
So there's your cruise ships, and that, uh, that's that fuel that just keeps coming out the whole time. They're in Sydney Harbour. <coughs> so this was a very interesting trailer that just came out a few weeks ago from a very good group in um, Ireland, Ola Hardyman is the main person over there. She's very good. And they have a very good cohort of people. They've got almost everybody in Ireland in their database, and they know what's going on. And they looked at how likely you are to inherit motor neuron disease, the hereditability. The statistics are quite difficult. I don't, don't understand them myself. But uh, basically what they said, I'm particularly interested, for those with no known genetic risk, you still had about a 40% chance of having a genetic cause for it. So in other words, there's something, as we say, you got bad genes from your, both your parents or something. But that does mean, of course, that 60% of your risk is environmental. So if you've got, if you've got, um, if you have a, you know, two parents with MND, that, that's, that's quite a risk factor for you, obviously. But if you have no parents with MND, you still have a, a risk genetically, but 60% is environment. So in fact, most of your risk is in the environment. So this and other studies, made us think what we really need is a new questionnaire for motor neuron disease. So we started this five or six years ago now. And the two things that are needed, one, it has to be easily accessible to everybody. So you don't have to fill in a form, etc. And it should be worldwide because a risk factor in Australia might be different completely from a risk factor in China or etc. So we decided and we derived this international questionnaire. I'm, I'm sure some of you have have done it. The MND associations have been very vigorous in promoting this, and around the world, the MND associations have been very good at promoting this questionnaire. It's quite a long questionnaire. It takes about two hours. You can do it in bits. You can do it ten minutes a day. But we have we are getting very interesting results from this. So we've asked a number of questions <coughs> that I've been uh, interested in for some time. And just grab my water. And I'll just briefly go through a, a few of these for, that you might have missed. So we, um, we wrote up our design for this in one of the journals, how we did it, the case control study. So we wanted people with MND and people without MND. In fact, people without MND are very important because otherwise you can't do the studies. And you can see this is a map in the green of all the countries that can do it. There's at least one um, official language of that country, so it can be done. So we've got responses from almost all these countries, a lot from Spain, interestingly enough. Anyway, the US, Australia, Canada have been the big three we've got, but we still, we've got from Russia, etc. We do need a few more. Uh, languages translated, volunteer, we get medical students to translate these. But if you know anybody who speaks Greek, Hungarian, Icelandic, Norwegian, Slovenian, or Turkish, we'd love to hear from you. Because what we do is we translate the questionnaire, uh, you're using Google Translate, but it's a bit rough, and so you have to have, to have someone who goes through it. We, uh, we <laughs> one of the questions was for measuring your finger length, you might have done it if you I'll talk, and I said, measure your finger length with a rigid ruler. We didn't want a tape measure. And in Chinese, it came out as, measure your finger with a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to correct it. And this was one of the, this was one of the things, because it had been suggested by others, so workers in the UK, that the, uh, your finger length between your ring finger and your index finger was different. So in other words, if you had a shorter index finger than your ring finger, you were more likely to get motor neuron disease. This has been suggested for, for example, athletes. Many elite athletes have shorter index fingers than ring fingers because this finger ratio relies on the amount of testosterone you've been exposed to uh, during pregnancy as a, as a fetus. And so for males and females. And so to thought maybe people who get ALS, motor neuron disease, later in life have been exposed to more testosterone in utero than before. And so a big, uh, 
lots of theories came about this, but that was done on quite a small number of people. Because we get large numbers of people without questionnaire, we could repeat that, and we showed that that wasn't the case. And so I know it sounds boring getting a negative result, but in fact, getting these early results on small numbers of people sort of wastes a lot of everybody's time, because other researchers think, oh, we'll carry on doing that. And so we've shown that that's not the case. And then something that interested me for many years when I was doing the MNT clinic, I always used to think, you know, you'd think to a neuron disease clinic would be quite depressing because, you know, it's not, you know, apart from a few things, there's not much you can do for people with MND yet. But in fact, it was never depressing because the people seemed so nice. And people said, why are these people so nice? I mean, they've got a, a very ordinary disease and, uh, you know, it's, other people with you know, bad disease, Parkinson's and MS, just don't seem so nice. And people wrote papers about this saying, gee, it's strange, people seem so nice. But nobody had actually looked at it carefully. And are people actually nice? And so we thought we'd look at it. And you can, there's a, the big five, you might have heard of it. Personality can be, your personality can be divided into five categories. And you can look at each of those five categories. And uh, scientifically, it's well recognized. We used to help with a psychologist, Susan Hayes. And uh, this is what we found. In fact, people with motor neuron disease had increased conscientiousness. That's one of the personality traits. They had increased extroversion. We do like people, you know, they go to a party if somebody was extroverted. They had increased in agreeableness and they had decreased neuroticism on these tests. These aren't, if you've done the questionnaire, you'll know, we don't ask, you know, are you conscientious? They're quite tricky little questions. And, and, so, uh, and, and so we've shown that, in fact, people with ALS, motor neuron disease, actually are, on average, nicer than people without it. Which makes you think, um, why should that be so? And what's that got to do with uh, ALS? Well, it actually goes a bit further than that because 50% of your personality is genetic. 50% is, you know, how nice your parents were, your friends were, etc., or how life has treated you. But 50% is genetic. And so maybe those genes that um, predispose you to be conscientious are also related to motor neuron disease. So I alerted my genetics friends, Ian Blair, etc., and said, maybe we should be having a look at these genes as well. Especially extroversion is, is quite genetic. You know this from <clears throat> your family is probably, you might have a, <clears throat> you might be an extrovert and your brother or sister might be quite introverted. So it's not just your um, environment, it's your genes as well. <clears throat> and also, if you are extroverted, you're more likely to smoke, you're more likely to have a dangerous occupation, you're more likely to have trauma, you know, you're going to be on a motorbike or bungee jumping or something, you're out there. And maybe that predisposes you to motor neuron disease. If you're more conscientious, maybe you have, you drink less alcohol. Funnily enough, alcohol, you think, is going to be a risk factor. But a number of studies showed that alcohol actually uh, uh, reduces your risk of ALS. I shouldn't tell you this. We'll have to, <laughs> can we take this out of the talk? Thank you very much. But, and maybe you are conscientious, so you listen to dietary things saying, I'll eat more fish. Yeah, fish is good, omega-3. Some fish aren't so good. Mercury, especially the big fish, the predatory fish, shark, and swordfish. So maybe you're taking in your mercury. We have a dietitian in the audience. You can ask her about that afterwards. And maybe your agreeableness and lack of neuroticism also predisposes you to certain occupations. So, although that was just a sort of curiosity question, that could be one little clue as to what's going on in ALS, the personality. Uh, just talking again about, we talked about uh, atmospheric mercury, but another source of mercury, of course, are dental amalgams. So you get a lot of a dental amalgam, silver amalgams are 50% mercury. Uh, and when you grind your teeth or chew, you do get a bit of mercury in. It's been a very controversial area. Some people say, nonsense, you know, it's a tiny amount. But, uh, but we thought maybe we should ask the question. So what we did, we, we compared uh, seafood consumption 
<coughs> of people with ALS, people who didn't have ALS, using our online questionnaire. <coughs> and we looked at people who had fillings and how many fillings they had. And you can, this is uh, fish consumption. It's actually quite difficult to do fish consumption. You can ask our dietitian in the audience afterwards, but we, we worked out a new way of looking at fish consumption. If you never ate fish, and if you ate fish pretty often over here, and you can see uh, <coughs> people with ALS <coughs> are red, controls are blue, fish consumption is exactly the same. <coughs> so fish consumption doesn't seem to be triggering ALS. <coughs> Unless, of course, you <clears throat> have a genetic predisposition to it. <clears throat> what about um, <clears throat> dental fillings? <clears throat> so here are the dental fillings. <clears throat> and these are <clears throat> present dental fillings, past dental fillings, silver amalgam fillings, exactly the same. <clears throat> so amalgam fillings, so. We, we don't recommend that people have their fillings removed. <coughs> I've still got mine, <coughs> uh, necessarily for, uh, for ALS. So it doesn't seem to be a risk factor. <coughs> and then the last thing we looked at, so many people said to me, you know, I'd had a very stressful time at work. You know, the boss was giving me a hard time and I couldn't pay the mortgage. <laughs> and then I got ALS. <coughs> So was stress precipitating ALS? And it's been suggested for a number of diseases, you know, Parkinson's, MS, et cetera. Stress, because stress does lots of things to the body, we know that. <clears throat> so again, we looked at a new way of looking at stress and the ways of assessing, and some of you have done the questionnaire, we'll see how that was done. There are a number of life events, there are 50 life events that are suggested to cause stress for a number of people or something like that. Losing a partner and you know, moving house and celebrating Christmas with the family, uh, the sort of thing, pretty stressful. And you put scores on those, and then you have self-described significant life events as well, things that weren't in that list, and you can actually add those up, and uh, and then and stress in your occupation. So we looked at all of those. Some people asked to rate the stress of their occupation. And then how you handle the stress depends on your resilience. Some people are more resilient than others. And your anxiety. And there are measurements for all of these. And then you, you correct for that and you get how much psychological stress that person was exposed to. Now, hypothesis was that people with ALS would have been exposed to more psychological stress. But these are the figures. <coughs> People in red have ALS, men over there. This is women over here. Each of those is a person, and that's their level. Life event stress, you can see, are exactly the same. The line in the middle is the average over here. So people with ALS, in fact, aren't exposed to more stress. In fact, when you speak to people, almost anybody, a lot of us in our society is under a lot of stress. And so, um, People with ALS don't seem to be particularly exposed to more. <clears throat> then we looked at resilience. So maybe it's the same amount of stress, but if people aren't as resilient, the stress will have more of an effect. But in fact, we found just the opposite. So <clears throat> here are men with ALS. Over here, their resilience is higher than controls, and women even higher. So people, with, which again is interesting, because much, much of resilience is genetic as well. People with ALS seem particularly resilient. Uh, two things, as a personality as well. So that was an unintended, uh, unanticipated um, finding. So maybe we should be looking at genetic links between resilience and ALS as well. <coughs> anxiety, are people with ALS more anxious? No, they're not. They exactly have the same levels of anxiety. Males over here, females over here, the bars in the middle. So, so ALS Quest so is continue, we want to continue it for another five years. Uh, we've got well over a thousand people in at the moment. We want uh, more, we want four or five thousand in fact. Uh, response from Australia has been fantastic, as you can imagine. From some countries we still have to nag them. Uh, but uh, I have a collaborator in the US who's very good, who's just finished her PhD on this. Jane Parkin, some of you might have met her. And we're working together to try to get more people. <coughs> 
What we're particularly short of are men who don't have ALS. So come on guys, I can see a few guys here who don't have ALS. We need men uh, because they're our smallest group and uh, for statistics your controls have to be about the same. We need everybody of course, but uh, men in particular. So uh, if you know any men who, uh, we've tried everything, you know, we've gone to uh, men's shed and various things. If you have any ideas as well, that'd be nice uh, how we can get more men. So that's all, all I've got to, to say. It's a big topic. It's called RC Experts. Of course, nobody is a complete expert on motor neuron disease. I subscribe to a service uh, called PubMed that tells you when the new papers are coming out, scientific papers, and I uh, get between 30 and 40 a week on everything. So just to keep up, who can keep up? So you times that by uh, 52. You do the math, that's a lot of stuff coming out in so many fields. It's, it's become, uh, special things like the ice bucket challenge and things, it's become a huge uh, 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 striving to, to find the cause and, and cure for ALS, so uh, you're not alone. So, is it time for questions? Yes, and we need, no, you don't get morning tea until I have t 10 questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's the rule. So, as we mentioned earlier, um, if you've got a question, raise your hand and a staff member will bring the cordless mic to you. If you don't wish to ask a question yourself or you're shy of speaking in public or it's just difficult to speak on a microphone, then we'll do that, ask the question for you. You won't be recorded in asking your questions. And also, just, so you, just to orientate you, this bookmark is, gives you a link to the, the research, the ALS quest that Roger was speaking about today. So hands up. Roger, what was the reason for the man to inject himself <coughs> with the mercury? Yes, that's a good question. What was the reason for the, uh, the young man to inject himself with mercury? He had a psychiatric condition so he wasn't uh, in fact um, a lot of uh, he might have read some websites from the US because there's a sort of cult of boxers in the US who think that's just going to strengthen them injecting mercury they think it's going to make them stronger so maybe the mercury just gets down into their feet and they you know they can't be knocked over because they come up every time no I'm being silly um, nobody knows why but we don't know why. It was two industrial thermometers. There was a lot of mercury. He came into Prince Alfred. He had x-rays. We could see the mercury in his lungs and his heart, etc. But as I say, he died a few weeks later after committing suicide. And had a post-mortem so he could see it. Yeah. Thanks for a great presentation. It was very, uh, very interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, insecticides uh, and herbicides as a potential factor. Has anyone looked at um, the comparison between obligate organic food eaters and perhaps people who just consume a general diet without a focus on organic foods? We are looking at that. If, uh, if and when you do the questionnaire, you can see we have a thing of the type of foods you eat. Actually, a food questionnaire, again, you have a dietitian, are very difficult to do because uh, you need sort of your the cause of your MND might have been 30 years ago, 40 years ago, something you ate, uh, your foods change, and so we couldn't do a, a a detailed food questionnaire. There has to be a separate question. It would have been huge. It would have taken hours. And always when you're designing a questionnaire, you don't want to fatigue people. You can't do anything. So we ask some basic things about whether you were a vegan or a vegetarian or ate meat and we're particularly interested in seafood eating. So we might be able to get some idea but nothing, nothing strong has come out. People have done food questionnaires in ALS and suggested if you drink more milk etc. But the data aren't good yet and so we really need, because we need large numbers uh, but we hope, uh, we haven't done all of the analysis of all the questions in our database, which is, which is huge, because we're waiting for greater numbers still for statistics. We may be able to answer some of that question in the future, though. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very topical area. I've heard 
that um, in some cases of environmental clusters where you get uh, uh, an over-exaggeration of ALS. So have you studied that and are there any clusters in Australia? Yes, the question was, uh, are there clusters of, of motor neuron disease in various parts of the world uh, and especially in Australia and has that been studied? Yes, that's a very good question. And there certainly are reported clusters. Uh, we've looked at a few in tiny towns and people said, oh, three people have got ALS. Uh, the problem, as I said, is ALS isn't all that uncommon. And when you start looking hard, uh, you actually find that there are quite a lot of people around with ALS. Uh, people have looked at things like blue-green algae, especially with the latest climate problems, so considering that. Very difficult studies. People at UTS and others around the world are looking at these algae, cyanobacteria, for example. That's one possibility. People have looked at power lines. That's kind of been ruled out now. A big Dutch study has pretty much ruled that. If you live near a power line or power plant, are you more likely to get it? Um, but also the overall around the world, the incidence, the number of new cases a year, is pretty similar if you look at it closely. So that sort of argues against clusters. It is an area, to do the study is very difficult, very expensive, because you can't just look at the people who've got ALS, you've got to look at the, the whole population around, do a proper survey. And nobody in Australia has done that really properly. People at Macquarie Uni have been looking at lead, a possibility, but of course a lot of us are exposed to lead in the past, especially from lead petrol, so that isn't a cluster as such. But certainly in the Balmain areas, for example, there's lots of lead in the soil from the old factories. And, uh, so there are studies waiting to be done, but uh, nothing convincing yet, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Could you just go over that um, genetic silences, did you say in that work? Yes, epigenetics or genetic silencing. Uh, it's a good question. Very topical area. Lots of people are looking at it. In fact, we've got a big study. You know there's this uh, project MINE that people have got together using uh, a lot of the uh, DNA from our previous DNA bank. Uh, let's motor neuron disease DNA bank, plus international, and they're looking at large series, and people in Queensland are, are putting all this together. Um, and uh, we're doing a big epigenetic study at the moment, looking at, because we know epigenetics, uh, changes occur due to certain toxins in the environment, so that's very nice. So what happened, epigenetics is, uh, Gene silencing. So you don't, you're, you've got all the same genes in each cell. All the same genes. But you don't want those genes to be working in each cell because you don't want brain proteins to start appearing in your liver to upset things. So these, these, uh, there are sites near the gene, epi, on top of the gene, that's called, that switch the gene on and off appropriately. Yes, we need something happening now. And so it's that mechanism that, that is being studied. And it's useful for a number of ways. Firstly, it can give you a lead as to maybe what the environmental cause is. And um, secondly, there are ways of changing the epigenetics with drugs. You can actually dampen down or increase it. So it's a very interesting area. Very complex because uh, it's best actually to have the particular tissue. So because the epigenetics in each different, your liver, and your brain everything is different. So ideally you would have the brain tissue, but we don't get brain tissue from enough people for the stats, so we're doing it on blood. So there are a number of difficulties at this early stages, but a lot of people are involved in epigenetics. And things like, now my favorite thing, mercury, actually alters the epigenetics as well. So that maybe the genes, some genes are being switched on that shouldn't be, and some genes are being switched off that shouldn't be. Looking at the 9-11 tragedy, um, that um, pulverised
utilised a huge number of buildings um, you know, 20 years ago um, and threw up quite a soup of um, potential toxins that were um, of a, a microscopic level that could be either inhaled uh, or even ingested. Given that it's now 20 years down the track, has there been anyone look at whether first responders who were um, heavily exposed to um, those dusts um, have had an increased risk of um, ALS? Yeah, nice idea. The question was, after 9-11, you know, the, uh, all the dust that was raised from the, the planes going into the buildings, uh, could that have be having an effect on people, especially the first responders and people around? It's possible. Uh, I'm sure people are going to be looking at it. The trouble is there's quite a long time lag between exposure and the onset of ALS, if the exposure is the problem. For example, uh, you can lose about 50% of your motor neurons and not know it because uh, the other neurons take over and they help. And sometimes only when those last few neurons are going do you start getting symptoms. It's a situation called crashing. People can be going on quite a long time and then suddenly they crash and then they're okay for a while and you suddenly get worse. It's not that the disease is suddenly getting worse, the neurons are probably being lost at the same rate, but you just lose it's sort of uh, the last straw that breaks the camel's back. So that all takes time. So maybe um, I've been, I'm sure that somebody's looking at it. It's such an obvious sort of public health thing. I think they're doing it for lung disease at the moment, but I'm sure that that group will be followed up. I hope they are anyway. I'll look it up to see if it is. It's a nice idea. Um. Airline pilots, do you have um, a percentage, keeping in mind that within Australia, I guess most of the pilots are male, yes. and they've probably been since their late teens, early 20s, and also what about cabin crew, again within Australia, which would probably be mainly female and probably not been in the industry as long as pilots? Yes, that's a very nice question. The question was, um, there does seem to be an increased risk of ALS in, in airline pilots. There seems to be, it hasn't been confirmed in bigger studies, that was work done in 2000 or so. And uh, what about cabin crew who are mostly female, do they always get it? Could it just be a gender effect? Um, interesting, I mean, we wrote a, thing on this some time ago, wondering why airline pilots should get more ALS. One of the things was that, uh, you know, when you're flying, you get to a certain height and you can't keep the same pressure in the cabin on ground as you are high up because the pressure outside is now much less. There's a big pressure differential and not the plane, just the walls would expand. <laughs> and. Uh, the plane would crash. So what they do is they drop the air pressure. You know, when you're all asleep, they drop and they drop the oxygen tension. And uh, so often, um, older people who are just managing on oxygen tension, they they suddenly get a bit disorientated sometimes in the flight. I don't know if this happened to you. And uh, so often you and your your um, jet lag office sometimes is due to this low oxygen that you're getting. And so maybe, and people have thought maybe low oxygen is a problem for motor neuron disease. And there's a gene called uh, VEGF that uh, has been suggested to be a risk factor for motor neuron disease, which is related to low oxygen. So maybe low oxygen. Also, airline pilots are exposed to quite a lot of fuel. In fact, there's often a bit of leakage of fuel into the cabins, and they're there for hours. So could it be a toxin? Uh, nobody's looked at air crew, which they should have. Maybe because air crew sort of move around quite a lot, be whereas airline pilots are there for a long time. I don't know exactly why, but it hasn't been looked at. But it's a very nice idea, and someone should do it. The whole study has to be repeated, though, because the numbers were a bit small. So uh, you have to make sure there, aren't some, there isn't some other factor in airline pilots that are making them more likely to get it. But a very nice idea. Thank you. What about iPhones that kids tend to use a lot of? Uh, does that play any part in affecting the brain? So what's that, the, the iPhones? 
iPhones. Yeah. Yes, iPhones. You know, I've, I've never thought of that. Um, they always talk about, uh, or the worry has been brain tumours, <laughs> because there's a certain amount of radiation. Uh, and usually people use their iPhone, I don't know what you do, usually people put it on the same ear, don't you? So they did a nice study, and there's a, a tumour that's related to the ear called an acoustic neuroma. And they looked at to see if people who use their, they asked people, what ear do you use your iPhone on? And then they saw if they got these tumours on that side. They didn't have enough numbers. So most people don't think that is the case now, that iPhones are. And the amount of, radio, uh, of radiation is quite, of, uh, is, is quite small. So, uh, and of course, the, although the rate of ALS does seem to be increasing slightly, that might be because we're diagnosing it better, but it hasn't increased dramatically in the last um, 20 or 30 years, or well, last 15 years since we've had iPhones. We'd only know again, unfortunately, in 15, 20 years, if that is the case. Interesting idea, but yeah, I don't, somehow I don't think it's going to happen. There's no, the, the physics isn't quite right for it to, to be a problem. You're much more likely to be run over with your iPhone. You know, you see people crossing the road. <laughs> <laughs> the question is not directed at your service, but it's about the fact that you have to be able to get cramping in most strange places yes. like under my chin and in my neck. Yes. What causes that? The question was, what causes cramping in, in ALS? I mean, it's a very good question, and for many people that's one of the most distressing things of ALS is, is the cramping. It's thought to be probably because of that upper motor neuron being a problem. And maybe those little interneurons as well in the spinal cord that dampen down the excitation. Your muscles are being excited too much. And uh, the, so that's probably why the, you get hyper, hypertonic and uh, cramping. There are various things, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not a prescribing physician anymore that people try and they've looked at making sure you're getting enough magnesium in your diet and various relaxants, but it, it, can, it can be a, a difficult thing. The exact electrophysiology, I'm not, I'm not an electrophysiologist, there are people who study this, I'm not sure. But it's mostly, I think, because of the, the loss of the neurons up here and the little neurons in the, uh, the spinal cord, that the lower motor neurons the ones are getting too excited and they're cramping the muscles up. Yeah. Have you, you've tried various things for it? Yes, I, I, I take magnesium, but I've also been prescribed gabapentin. Yes, Gabba. As I say, I'm not sure the pharmacology of it anymore, but uh, yeah, there are things you can try. But it can be pretty persistent, I've heard, yeah. We might make time for one last question. Yes. Um, Dr. Lee, we did start a little bit late, so we're sort of slightly off what the program timing is, but I think asking these questions is really, really invaluable and important. I will be here for lunch. If any of you have got any one-to-one -one questions that you want to ask, just please come up and say hello. It would be lovely to meet you. Um, when you were saying that the excitement of the upper motor neurons are bad for the rest of the body, like if you go on a roller coaster, um, does that mean you should avoid roller coasters? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm yeah. just thinking for my husband because when we go on roller coasters, because he, he gets so excited, his legs get so stiff that he can hardly get off them. Is that so? That's yeah. the, the question was, should we do things that are uh, exciting? Because maybe it in, anecdotally can cause uh, increased stiffness. I, you know, I'm not the right person to ask, because again, that's electrophysiology. There are some very good people at, at Sydney Uni who think that excitation, they measure the, you can measure the amount of excitation of the motor neurons, and they think it all starts over here in this upper one, and then it, it's bombarding the lower one all the time. Uh, I think it's actually the, the, the motor neuron here works on muscle, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily work on the excitement you get for you know, doing something dangerous. Uh, 
maybe he was doing something dangerous because he's extroverted, you know, and, you know <laughs> so as we talked about later, he had this outgoing personality that loved doing new things and extroversion. So I can't think of a sort of logical, physiological way that sort of uh, environmental excitation could cause it. I'll think about it and make up something over lunch. Shall I? <laughs>